Well, good morning, Jubilee Saints. This is Pastor Darren here with Fred Kisser this morning. We're going to be continuing in our series in Genesis. We'll be in Genesis chapter 14 today, thanking uh, David Viet for covering Genesis 13 for us last week, that interesting study with Abram and Lot. Um, today we have a really interesting study here um, in Genesis, the action-packed uh, chapter of Genesis chapter 14. And we're going to sing together again verse before we get into our lesson. But before we do all of that, um, let's open up with a word of prayer. Would you bow your heads with me? Lord God Almighty, we thank you for today. We thank you for the privilege of, at least for now, being in a free country, uh, the ability to open your word freely, to study your word together. Lord, even here, even though we're not able to meet in person, that we're able to meet um, in our homes and open God's word together using this wonderful tool um, online. And so, Lord, I do pray for Fred as he opens your word today. I pray that your Holy Spirit would speak through him, that we would learn and apply uh, the word of God that you have for us today. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. And welcome. Genesis 14 is what we'll be focusing on today. And as we lead into that, we'll sing the familiar Fanny Crosby song, Praise Him, Praise Him. And as we do that, focus particularly on the third verse, the third and final stanza that talks about Jesus Christ is prophet and priest and king. Turn with me, if you would, to Genesis chapter 14. We'll be reading the text first. Uh, we'll divide this into two major sections and read the first 16 verses as the first portion. Comments, including some verbatim quotes, will be drawn largely from Jameson, Fawcett, and Brown commentary, the MacArthur Study Bible, the Believer's Bible commentary, and Warren Wearin's Warren Wearsby's Bible Exposition Commentary. So first, the text, and we could entitle this, Abram Rescues Lot. And it came about in the days of Aramphel, king of Shinar, Ariok, king of Elisar, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, that they made war with Bera, king of Sodom, and with Bersha, king of Gomorrah, Shinab, king of Adma, and Shemibar, king of Zeboim, and the king of Bela, that is, Zoar. All these came as allies to the valley of Siddim, that is, the Salt Sea. 
Twelve years they had served Cheddar Leomar, but the thirteenth year they rebelled. And in the fourteenth year, Cheddar Leomar and the kings that were with him came and defeated the Rephaim and Ashtoreth Carnaim, and the Zuzim and Ham, and the Emim in Sheva Kiriathaim, and the Horites in their Mount Seir, as far as El Paran, which is by the wilderness. Then they turned back and came to An Mishpat, that is Kadesh, and conquered all the country of the Amalekites and also the Amorites who lived in Hazazon Tamar. And the king of Sodom and the king of Gomorrah and the king of Adma and the king of Zeboim and the king of Bela, that is Zoar, came out, and they arrayed for battle against them in the valley of Siddim. Against Chedorlaomer, Omar, king of Elam, and Tidal, king of Goyim, and Ramphel, king of Shinar, and Ariok, king of Elisar. Four kings against five. Now the valley of Siddim was full of tar pits, and the kings of Sodom and Gomorrah fled, and they fell into them. But those who survived fled to the hill country. Then they took all the goods of Sodom and Gomorrah, and all their food supply, and departed. And they also took Lot, Abraham, Abram's nephew, and his possessions and departed, for he was living in Sodom. Then a fugitive came and told Abram the Hebrew. Now he was living by the oaks of Mamre, the Amorite, brother of Eshcol and brother of Aner, and these were allies with Abram. And when Abram heard that his relative had been taken captive, he led out his trained men, born in his house, 318, and went in pursuit as far as Dan. And he divided his forces against them by night, he and his servants, and defeated them and pursued them as far as Hobah, which is north of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods and also brought back his relative Lot with his possessions and also the women and the people. So here's an overview starting in verse 1, which says, And it came about, or it came to pass. This chapter presents Abram in the unexpected character of a warrior. Here was the situation. The king of Sodom and the kings of the adjoining cities, after having been tributaries for twelve years to the king of Elam, joined forces with each other to, th to throw off his yoke. Chedorlaomer was what we would call a suzerain, or feudal overlord, who extracted tribute from these other kings. So when they rebelled against him with the aid of three allies, he invaded the territories of these rulers, defeated them in a pitched battle where the nature of the ground favored his army, Genesis 14.10, and hastened in triumph on his homeward march with a large amount of captives and booty. Raiding, conquering, and making other kings and city-states subservient vessel vassals were all part of the world of the Fertile Crescent in Abram's day. The vassal states miscalculated Cheddar Leomar's strength, and they lost the battle. As you may recall, Lot had chosen what looked to him to be the good territory to settle in, and was by then a resident of Sodom, and he was taken captive. Backing up to chapter 13 that we focused on last week, we read starting in verse 5, Now Lot, who went with Abram, also had flocks and herds and tents. And the land could not sustain them while dwelling together, for their possessions were so great that they were not able to remain together. And there was strife between the herdsmen of Abram's livestock and the herdsmen of, life, of Lot's livestock. Now the Canaanite and the Perizzite were dwelling then in the land. Then Abram said to Lot, Please let there be no strife between you and me, nor between my herdsmen and your herdsmen, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Please separate from me. If to the left, then I will go to the right, or if to the right, then I will go to the left. And you recall what happened. Lot lifted up his eyes and saw all the valley of the Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere. This was before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt as you go to Zoar. So Lot chose for himself all the valley of the Jordan, and Lot journeyed eastward. Thus they separated from each other. So Genesis 13:12, Abram settled in the land of Canaan, while Lot settled in the cities of the valley and moved his tents as far as Sodom. Now the men of Sodom were wicked exceedingly and sinners against the Lord. So 
Abram graciously gave up the choice pasture land, but God wound up giving him and his descendants the whole land of Canaan and forever. So, we think of Lot. Lot was a true believer, but was a worldly Christian. And he was a, a backslider. Uh, I should say he was a worldly believer. And as always, as is always ultimately the case, he reaped what he had sown. So, we think of uh, the cardinal Christian virtue, humility. Philippians 2, 3, and 4, do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit, but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. Do not merely look out for your own personal interests, but also for the interests of others. So note the steps. Uh, although Lot was a true, truly was a true believer, and we find this if we look at 2 Peter chapter 2, verses 7 and 8. And if he, God, rescued righteous Lot, oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men, for by what he saw and heard that righteous man, while living among them, felt his righteous soul tormented day after day with their lawless deeds. So we see three times here, Lot is called righteous. So he was a believer, but he was a worldly backslider, and he reaped what he had sown. Note the steps in, his, uh, in, in the backsliding that he uh, accomplished and his worldliness and his carnality. First, Lot and his men experienced strife, as we saw in Genesis 13, 7. Then he saw, verse 10. He chose, verse 11. He pitched his tent toward, verse 12. He resided away from the place where God's priest was, chapter 14, verse 12. And then he sat in the gate, which was the, politic the place of political power. And we see that when we get to chapter 19, verse 1. In other words, he in effect becomes a local official in Sodom. First steps of faith are not always giant steps, which explains why Abraham did not fully obey God all the time. Instead of leaving his family as he was commanded, when he was first called, he took his father and his nephew Lot with him when he left Ur of the Chaldees, and then he stayed at Haran until his father died. Whatever you bring with you from the old life into your new life as a believer is likely to create problems. Terah, Abram's father, kept Abram from fully obeying the Lord. And Lot, as we see, created serious problems for Abram until they finally had to agree to part. Abram and Sarah brought a sinful agreement with them from Ur, the agreement that uh, Sarah would say that Abram was her brother rather than her husband. And it got them into trouble on two different occasions, chapter 12, verses 10 to 20 that we looked at a couple of weeks ago, and then it'll happen again in chapter 20, verses 1 to 18. So the life of faith demands total separation from what is evil and total devotion to what is holy. 2 Corinthians 6, 14 to 7, 1. Do not be bound together with unbelievers, for what partnership have righteousness and lawlessness, or what fellowship has light with darkness, or what harmony has Christ with Belial? Or what has a believer in common with an unbeliever? Or what agreement has the temple of God with idols? And of course, the answer is absolutely none. For we are the temple of the living God, just as God said, I will dwell in them and walk among them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Therefore come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord, and do not touch what is unclean, and I will welcome you. And I will be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. So, as we study the life of Abraham, we discover that he was often tempted to compromise, and occasionally he yielded. 
God tests us in order to build our faith and bring out the best in us, but Satan tempts us in order to destroy our faith and bring out the worst in us. So, the contrast uh, with Ab between Abram and Lot, Abram did not exalt himself. Abram built an altar. This was actually his third one. He built the first one back in Genesis 12:7, the next one in 12:8, and now in Genesis 13:18. He did so to worship God. He built an altar for God, but he didn't even build a house for himself. Remember, where did he live? He lived in a tent. So let's go back to our text in Genesis 14, 1 to 12. Thirteen years before the main events of this chapter, Chedorlaomer, king of Elam, or Persia, had conquered various kings in the plains adjacent to the Dead Sea, or the Salt Sea. In the thirteenth year, the five captive kings rebelled against Chedorlaomer. So he allied himself with three other kings from the region of Babylon, marched south along the eastern side of the Dead Sea, then north on the western side of it to Sodom, Gomorrah, and the other cities of the plain. The battle took place in the valley of Siddim, which was full of tar or asphalt pits. The invaders defeated the rebels and marched north with their booty and captives, including Lot, Abram's black backslidden nephew. So again, Chedorlaomer and his allies defeat the five king confederacy. They carry Lot and the others away along with great spoils. When Abraham learns of it, he assembles an army and defeats Chedorlaomer. He rescues Lot and the others along with the spoils. When Abram received the news, he assembled a fighting force of 318 trained men and pursued the victors to Dan in the north. He finally defeated them near Damascus in Syria and rescued Lot and all the spoils. Backsliders bring not only misery on themselves, but trouble on others. Here Abram delivered Lot by the sword. Later he delivers him through intercessory prayer in chapters 18 and 19. So now let's return to the text at verse 17 of chapter 14 and go through the end of the chapter. Genesis 14, 17. Abram is blessed by Melchizedek. Then after his return from the, tree, from the defeat of Chedorlaomer the king, and the kings who were with him, the king of Sodom went out to meet him at the valley of Sheva, that is the king's valley. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought out bread and wine. Now he was a priest of God Most High. And he blessed him that is, Melchizedek blessed Abram and said, Blessed be Abram of God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be God Most High, who has delivered your enemies into your hand. And he, Abram, gave him, Melchizedek, a tenth of all. And the king of Sodom said to Abram, Give the people to me and take the goods for yourself. And Abram said to the king of Sodom, I have sworn to the Lord God Most High, possessor of heaven and earth, that I will not take a thread or a sandal thong or anything that is yours, lest you should say, I have made Abram rich. I will take nothing except what the young men have eaten and the share of the men who went with me, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre. Let them take their share. So, we see that Melchizedek goes out and meets Abram. Melchizedek means king of righteousness. And remember, he was king of Salem. We think of uh, Jerusalem, that's short for Jerusalem. And we think of the word peace in conjunction with that. You know the familiar Hebrew greeting, Shalom. That's what this is, Salem, peace. So Melchizedek, his name meant king of righteousness and he was king of Salem, king of peace. Melchizedek's priesthood was unique in that it did not have a recorded beginning or a recorded ending. So, Genesis 14, verses 17 and 18, as Abram was returning home, 
The king of Sodom went out to meet him, just as Satan often tempts the believers after they, the believer after they have a great spiritual victory. But Melchizedek, king of Salem, and priest of God Most High, was on hand with bread and wine to strengthen Abram. We cannot read this first mention of bread and wine without thinking of these symbols of our Savior's passion as symbolized in what we today call the Lord's Supper. When we consider the price Jesus paid to save us from our sin, we are strengthened to resist every sinful temptation. Now, names in Scripture have meanings. As we said, Melchizedek means king of righteousness, and Salem, short for Jerusalem, means peace. So Melchizedek was king of righteousness and king of peace. He's a symbol of Christ, true king of righteousness and true king of peace, and our great high priest. When it says in the New Testament in Hebrews 7, 3, that Melchizedek was without father, without mother, without genealogy, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, this is to be understood only in connection with his priesthood. Most priests, if you think about it, inherited their office and served for a limited time, a limited tenure. But the, the priesthood of Melchizedek was unique in that, at least as far as the record is concerned, it was not passed on to him from his parents and it did not have a beginning or an end. Christ's priesthood is according to the order of Melchizedek. And we see this in Hebrews 7.25. Hence also Jesus is able to save forever those who draw near to God through him since he always lives to make intercession for them. And we see it predictively in Psalm 110.4. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. Thou art a priest forever according to Melchizedek. So, in chapter 14, verses 19 and 20 of Genesis, Melchizedek blessed Abram, and Abram in turn gave to this priest of God a tithe of all his captured prizes. In Hebrews 7, we learn that there was a deep spiritual significance to these actions. Because Abram was the forefather of Aaron, he is seen as representing the Aaronic priesthood. The fact that Melchizedek blessed Abram means that Melchizedek's priesthood is greater than Aaron's priesthood because the one who blesses is superior to the one who is blessed. The fact that Abram paid tithes to Melchizedek is seen as a picture of the Aaronic priesthood acknowledging the superiority of Melchizedek's priesthood because the lesser pays tithes to the greater. So Abram's paying tithes to Melchizedek, as I just mentioned, is seen as a picture of Aaron's priesthood under Moses, acknowledging the superiority of Melchizedek's priesthood and ultimately of Christ's priesthood. So thus, Christ's priesthood is superior to Aaron's priesthood in the Mosaic Covenant. Melchizedek's priesthood thus typifies or foreshadows Christ. And so we say that Aaron was a type of Christ. That's a Bible term meaning he foreshadowed Christ. And the opposite of that, if you will, Christ is the antitype, the antitype of Melchizedek. So, the king of Sodom said, in effect, give me the persons, you take the material things. So Satan still tempts us to be occupied with toys of dust while people around us are perishing. Abram replied, though, that he wouldn't take anything from a thread to a sandal strap. So now we move on, uh, backing up a, a little bit. We see Abram in this chapter Abram, the man of faith, fulfilling three special roles. The role of the watcher, the role of the warrior, and the role of the worshiper. In all three roles, Abraham exercised faith in God and made the right decision. So first, Abram, the watcher, Genesis 14, 1 to 12. 
This section, as we've seen, actually records the first war mentioned in the Bible, and it would not even be included here had it not involved Abram. The Bible records a great deal of history, but as Dr. A.T. Pearson has, has said, history is his story. What is written helps us better understand how God worked out his great plan of salvation in this world. And in Romans, you know, when we get to chapter 15, it talks about these things were written for our instruction. Uh, actually, that's in 1 Corinthians, upon whom the ends of the ages has, have come. But Romans 15 talks about we need to learn from the things that have been written down in God's Word. So, in the Bible, historical facts are often windows for spiritual truth. The five city-states in the plain of the Jordan had been subject, as we saw, for 12 years to the kings of the four eastern city-states and finally revolted against them. This, of course, was a declaration of war, so the four kings invaded the plain of Jordan to bring those five kings into subjection. Now, from our modern viewpoint, this invasion was, would kind of be looked at as a minor skirmish, but in that day it was considered a major international conflict. Certainly, the five kings defending their territory who were rebelling ought to be able to defeat four kings, especially since they were fighting on their own turf. But the army of the cities of the plain was soundly defeated by the invading kings. Apparently, the five kings did not even know their own land because they were trapped in those tar or slime pits, verse 10. All their army could do was to flee from the hills. While reviewing his troops on a somewhat uh, humorous note, the Duke of Wellington is supposed to have said, I don't know what effect these men will have on the enemy, but they frighten me. So the, the people were, were not prepared to do battle, even on their own turf. Ezekiel 16, 49 to 50 suggests that the lifestyle of the people of Sodom and Gomorrah did not prepare them for conflict. Compare that with 1 John 2, 15 to 17, which says, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away, and also its lusts. But the one who does the will of God abides forever. So whatever purposes the kings may have had in this war, God had something special in mind for Lot. He became a POW, a prisoner of war. Remember, we saw Lot had looked at Sodom. He had moved toward Sodom, and now he was living in Sodom. You might not guess it from his conduct, but as we've seen, Lot was indeed a righteous man, according to 2 Peter 2, 6-8. So where did he fail? Well, while in Egypt with Abraham, as we've seen, Lot had gotten a taste of the world, and he enjoyed it. Scripture doesn't record that Lot ever built an altar and sought the Lord, as did his uncle Abraham. Abraham was the friend of God, James 2.23, but Lot was the friend of the world, James 4.4. 4. In time, Lot conformed to the world, Romans 12.2, and when Sodom lost the war, Lot was condemned along with the world, 1 Corinthians 11.32. If you identify with the world, then expect to suffer what the world suffers. Lot's capture was God's way of disciplining him and reminding him that he had no business living in Sodom. No doubt Abram was praying faithfully for his nephew that he might separate himself from the world and start living like a true stranger and pilgrim for the Lord. God disciplines his children because he loves them and wants the best for them. We see that in, for example, Proverbs 3, 11, and 12, and Hebrews chapter 12, verses 1 to 11. Discipline is an evidence of sonship. If we don't listen to God's rebukes, then 
he has to get our attention some other way, and that other way is usually very painful. So we had Abraham the watcher, now we have Abraham the warrior in verses 13 through 16. So we look at his attitude. Abram did not get, get involved in the war until he heard that Lot had been captured, and then he began to act. Abram was separated, but not isolated. He was independent, but not indifferent. In fact, he and some of the local sheikhs had formed an alliance for just such emergencies, as we see in verse 13. He was Abram the Hebrew, which means the outsider, the person with no secure place in society. He was Abram the Hebrew, but not Abram the hard-hearted. He was a pilgrim and stranger in the land, but that was no excuse for inaction on his part. So, while believers must not compromise with the unsaved in matters of spiritual walk and ministry, like we saw in 2 Corinthians 6, 14-7-1, they may cooperate when it comes to caring for humanity and what we might call promoting the general welfare. When you see that people are in trouble, you don't ask them for a testimony before helping them. Sacrificial service is one way of showing the love of Christ to others. Matthew 5.16 If Christians don't carry their share of the common burdens of life, how can they be the salt of the earth and the light of the world? And, of course, Matthew 5.16 talks about uh, that you should be the light of the world. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father who is in heaven. For example, Joseph served in Egypt, and God used him to preserve both his family and the Jewish nation. Nehemiah served a heathen king. Yet God used the authority and resources of that king to enable Nehemiah to rebuild Jerusalem. Esther was a Jewess, married to a Gentile ruler, and God used her to protect the Jewish people from almost certain annihilation. Daniel in Babylon never compromised his convictions, but he did assist several rulers and was greatly used by God. So we may cooperate with different people at different times to achieve different purposes, but we should always be conscious of our primary obligation to glorify God. Abram treated his nephew Lot with love, both when he gave Lot first choice of the land back in Genesis 13, and when he risked his own life to rescue him here in Genesis 14. Lot had not been kind to Abram, and Abram had every excuse to let his nephew suffer the painful consequences of his own foolish decisions. But Lot was his quote-unquote brother, chapter 14, verse 16. So Abram practiced brotherly love and overcame evil with good, as we see, for example, in Romans 12, 17 to 21, and Galatians 6, 1 and 2. Then we... In, under the heading of Abram the warrior, we had his attitude. Now we have his army. Though a man of peace, Abram was prepared for war. He was prepared for war. He didn't fight from selfish motives to get personal gain, but he fought because he loved Lot and wanted to help him. When you consider the characteristics of Abram's army, you see what it takes in the spiritual realm to have victory over the world. So, some of the things we see about the army of Abram, they were born in his house, verse 14. Spiritually speaking, this reminds us that whatever is born of God overcomes the world, 1 John 5, 4. Our first birth makes us children of Adam, and he was a loser. But our second birth makes us children of God, and Jesus Christ is the victor. He has overcome every enemy, we read in Ephesians chapter 1, and he shares his victory with all who will trust him. Again, 1 John 5, 14, and this is the victory that has overcome the world, our faith. So, his army, the people in his army were born in his house. They were armed. It takes more than zeal and courage to win a war. You must also have effective equipment. The Christian soldier must wear the whole armor of God and use the spiritual weapons God has provided. 
Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. Our weapons are spiritual, not fleshly, 2 Corinthians 10, 3 to 5, and we use them in the power of the Holy Spirit. The Word of God and prayer are our two most effective weapons, Acts 6, 4, and we must use them by faith. As the well-known song expresses it, put on the gospel armor, each piece put on with prayer. Then, regarding Abram's army, the men were trained, verse 14. So no matter how good their equipment is, if the soldiers are not trained, they will be easily defeated. One of the purposes of the local church is to train God's people how to use the Bible effectively, how to pray, how to recognize the enemy, and how to follow orders as soldiers in the army of Christ. The better you know your Bible, the better you're equipped to fight the battle, 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17. Jesus, the captain of our salvation, wants to train us and make us perfect or complete, Hebrews 13, verses 20 to 21. And the Greek word means to equip an army. If we fail in the battle, it's not the fault of the equipment or the strategy of our captain. Something went wrong with the soldiers. This is the concept of discipleship. As one uh, book's title says, disciples are made, not born. What are you doing to become a disciple of Jesus? And what are you doing to help others, help train others to become disciples? Again, remember that discipleship involves discipline and is intentional and sequential. Be a disciple of Jesus Christ. Then the fourth thing regarding Abram's uh, warriors, they believed in their leader. Abram and his allies rode 120 miles to make a surprise attack on the four kings, and they won a complete victory. Apparently, Abram got his directions from the Lord, so the whole enterprise was a victory of faith. The spiritual application for us is clear. If God's people expect to defeat their enemies, they must trust the Lord and obey his orders. This is how Joshua conquered the promised land and how David defeated the enemies of Israel, and this is the way the church must fight today. Then the fifth characteristic of Abram's warriors, they were united. There were not three armies with three leaders. There was one army, and Abram was in charge. If God's people today were united in love, what victories we would win. We sing, like a mighty army moves the church of God. But the church, unfortunately, is very unlike an army, especially when it comes to the discipline of marching together. The trouble with the church, said one pastor, is that there are too many generals and not enough privates. Then the sixth characteristic of Abram's warriors was that they were single-minded. Their goal was not personal revenge or private gain, but victory over the enemy so that the captives might be freed. A double-minded soldier is destined for defeat. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, of everyday life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier, 2 Timothy 2.4. When you remember Achan in Joshua 7, Samson in Judges 13-16, and the Old Testament king Saul in 1 Samuel 15, you will see how true that statement is. And then finally, Abram's achievement. Abram and his allies were so strong that they chased the enemy for a hundred miles, freed all the captives, and recovered all the spoils. Did Abram and his worldly nephew have a long talk as they rode back? Did Lot keep the promises he probably made to the Lord while he was in danger? Did he make any promises to Abram? Well, we cannot answer those questions, but we do know this. Neither the Lord's chastening nor the Lord's goodness in rescuing Lot did him any good. The goodness of God should have led him to repentance, but instead of repenting, Lot returned to Sodom. He could have been reunited with Abram, but he chose to go back to sin. Abram was the father of the faithful, wrote Alexander White, and Lot, his nephew, was the father of all such as are scarcely saved. Some indeed will be saved, yet so as by fire, 1 Corinthians 3.15, 
But isn't it far better to have an abundant entrance, an abundant entrance into the Lord's everlasting kingdom? 2 Peter 1.11. So we have Abram the watcher, Abram the warrior, and then his third role, Abram the worshiper, chapter 14, verses 17 to 24. First, we have a new battle. Sometimes you face your greatest dangers after you have won a battle. It was after the capture of Jericho that Israel's self-confidence led it into defeat at Ai, as you recall, back in Joshua 7. And after his success on Mount Carmel, what did Elijah do? Well, he panicked and ran away in fear. 1 Kings chapter 19. No wonder the Scottish pastor Andrew Bonar said, let us be as watchful after the victory as before the battle. When Abram returned from battle, he was met by two kings, Bera, king of Sodom, meaning burning, and Melchizedek, king of Salem, meaning peace, as we've seen. Bera offered Abram all the spoils in return for the people, while Melchizedek gave Abram bread and wine. Abram rejected Bera's offer, but accepted the bread and wine from Melchizedek, and gave him tithes of the spoils. All of this is symbolic and presents some important spiritual truths that we should understand and apply today. Abram had to choose between two kings who represented two opposite ways of life. Sodom was a wicked city, and Bera represented the dominion of this world system with its appeal to the flesh. Bera means gift, suggesting that the world bargains for your allegiance. But Sodom means burning, so be careful how you choose. Remember Satan in tempting Jesus said, I'll give all these things to you if you bow down and worship me. If you bow down to Bera, everything you live for will burn up one day. And that's exactly what will happen to Lot. Melchizedek, on the other hand, means king of righteousness and Salem king of peace and Salem means peace, as we've seen. Hebrews seven and Psalm one ten both connect Melchizedek with Jesus, the King of Peace and the King of Righteousness. Like Melchizedek in Abraham's day, Jesus Christ is our King Priest in heaven, enabling us to enjoy both righteousness and peace as we serve him. And Melchizedek and Christ are the only two king priests that God has ever accepted. And of course, Jesus also fulfilled the role of prophet. Certainly, we can see in the bread and wine that Melchizedek gave uh, Abram a reminder of our Lord's death for us on the cross. So, when Abram rejected Bera and accepted Melchizedek, he was making a statement of faith saying, Take the world, but give me Jesus, as the song says. Lot should have made the same decision, but he chose to return to his life of compromise. Why would it have been wrong for Abram to take the spoils? After all, didn't he risk his life and the lives of his retainers to defeat the invading kings and rescue the prisoners? Well, of course, legally, Abram had every claim to the spoils, but morally they were out of bounds. Many things in this world are legal as far as courts are concerned, but morally wrong as far as God's people are concerned. Furthermore, before Abram could take the spoils, he had to agree to restore the people of Sodom to their king who said, give me the persons, Genesis 14, 21. Just as God wants to use human bodies for his glory, Romans 12, 1 and 2, and 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20, so the, enem the enemy wants to use human bodies for evil purposes, Romans 6, 12 to 13. The enemy said, in effect, give me your body to Joseph in Genesis 39 and to Daniel, Daniel 1, but they said, no. But when the enemy said the same to Samson in Judges 16, to David in 2 Samuel 11, and to Judas in John 13, 27, they said, yes, and what a price they each paid. Abram did not accept King Bera's offer. Instead, it's likely that Abram gave everyone he had rescued 
opportunity to come with him and trust the true and living God. Abram, remember, was a powerful sheikh, and his neighbors knew about his tent and his altar. But there is no indication that any of them, including regrettably Lot and his family, accepted his invitation. Except for Lot and two of his daughters, they all subsequently perished in the destruction of Sodom. So, we have Abram as the watcher, the warrior, and the worshiper. We have just covered the new battle, and now we have a new blessing. Melchizedek had something better to offer Abram, the blessing of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth. Abram lived by the blessing of the Lord, not the bribery of the world. He did not want anybody to think that the world made him rich. Even a small thing like a shoelace might affect his walk. Too many servants of God have weakened their testimony by accepting applause and gifts from the people of the world. You cannot be a servant of God and a celebrity in the world at the same time. Melchizedek met Abram after the battle to strengthen him for the victory. The Lord knows the temptations we face after we have defeated the enemy. Abram had met the Lord before the battle and promised to take nothing for himself from the spoils of victory. He was single-minded as he led his army and God gave him victory. Abram did not impose his convictions on his allies, Aner, Eshkol, and Mamre, Genesis 14:24. If they wanted to take part of the spoils, that was their business, and he would not criticize them. Nor did he expect them to give tithes to Melchizedek. Abram was a pilgrim and stranger, while his allies were men of the world whose conduct was governed by a different set of standards. And the standard that Abraham chose was, Others may, you cannot. Others may, you cannot. We must be careful to give out of the devotion of our hearts and not as a bribe, quote-unquote, for God's blessings. As the late R.G. Letourneau, well-known Christian manufacturer and philanthropist, used to say, If you tithe because it pays, it won't pay. But Abram provides us with a good example of giving. He brought his gifts to Jesus Christ in the person of Melchizedek. We do not give our tithes and offerings to the church, the pastor, or the members of the finance committee. If our giving is a true act of worship, we will give to the Lord. And for that reason, we want to give our very best. Malachi 1, 6 to 8. 2 Corinthians 8 to 5 shows us the key. They first gave themselves to the Lord. And this was Paul referring to the churches of Macedonia. First, we must give ourselves to the Lord. Abram was prompt in his giving, and his stewardship principles were firmly fixed in his heart, so there was no reason to delay. He was also proportionate in his giving, a policy encouraged by the Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians 16, 1-2. And then Abram gave because he loved God and wanted to acknowledge God's greatness and God's goodness. What a contrast between the Most High God and the heathen idols. Abram's God is possessor or creator of heaven and earth. He deserves all the worship and praise of all his people. Before the battle, Abram lifted his hand by faith in a solemn vow to God that he would take nothing from the spoils. He had a single heart and mind as he led the army, Matthew 6, 24. During the battle, Abram wielded his sword by faith and trusted God for victory. After the battle, by faith, Abram closed his hands to the king of Sodom, but opened his hands to the king of Salem, receiving bread and wine and giving tithes. And this is the victory that has overcome the world our faith, 1 John 5, 4. So, in righteousness, God reveals, his ch reveals chiefly his love of holiness. In justice, chiefly his hatred of sin. Neither justice nor righteousness is a matter of arbitrary will. They are revelations of the nature of God, wrote Augustus Hopkins Strong. 
So takeaways, first of all, give yourself wholly to the Lord, Romans 12, 1. I urge you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship. Then get your convictions from God, the very next verse in Romans, and do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. Third, don't compromise your convictions. We already covered 1 John 2, 15 to 17, which talks about do not love the world nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away and also its lust, but the one who does the will of God abides forever. And finally, consider the godly example of Abram in Genesis chapter 13 and 14. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for the godly example of Abram. Lord, may we, like he, be considered people of faith, obeying you, seeking you, and being continually transformed into the image of Christ. For it's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen.